and welcome to the SheClicks webinar about Affinity Photo. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of SheClicks. Before we get started, we have a word from our sponsor, which is Affinity Photo. If you could create your own photo editing software for working on your best images, it would be like this. Whether it's quick corrections, delicate retouching or immersing yourself in complex fine art with hundreds of layers, Affinity Photo has you covered on Mac, PC and iPad with no subscription. Check out Affinity Photo to start your journey. So let's get started. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Joe Bradford, who is an award-winning photographer, best-selling author and photography educator. Hi, Joe. how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to She Clicks. Thank you. <laughs> so um, do you want to crack straight on? Because I know you've got a lot to cover. I have, absolutely. Let me just get my screen share up and running. And OK, so hi, everybody. I'm Jo, as you probably all know now from that fantastic introduction. Thank you, Angela. Um, I have this studio space here called Green Island Studios. It's my studio and workshop place, and it's based on a hilltop on North Dartmoor. So um, I've got panoramic views out of my window, which can be quite distracting in the daytime. Um, and as Angela just said, I'm an analog and digital photographer, and I own and operate one of the last private colored darkrooms in the UK. Um, apart from that though, and the writing and lecturing and all the other bits that I do, I'm here today because of my other hat that I wear, and that's as a qualified high-end retoucher. Um, I previously used the Adobe Creative Suite for many, many years, a very expensive relationship that was too, but I switched allegiances to Affinity Photo by Serif in 2015, and I haven't looked back quite honestly since then. So um, a little note about editing before we start. Editing goes hand in hand with taking the photo. It's always been a two-step process as far as I'm concerned. Um, you take your photos on film in the back in the day and then you process and develop those printed images um, and have something to, to, to put on your wall or put in a magazine afterwards. And to make that print really sing, you'd use the same tools we use today, like um, dodging and burning to alter the amount of light and exposure and to just basically pimp that print. So having a look here at some of these photos that were released by Magnum Photos, you can see a, a, a closer look really at the process that's followed by their master printer, Pablo Inirio, and you can see just how much time and attention was spent on altering very small areas of the image with lightening and darkening areas to bring the areas of the print out that they wanted to have attention to. So here you go, some more examples. Look at all the different details changed just on Audrey Hepburn's face alone. So. Um, Years ago, the only way to print a photo was to make lots and lots of test strips, make test prints, go back and forth, as I said, dodging and burning details. And this would um, mean that you would get the result you were after, but it took a lot of time to craft it. And I think it's still important so that, that you carry on in this way until you get the result you're after. You should still think about making your prints as crafting the results. So I always say to my students that it's important to do less in order to do more when you're editing your work. So I think it's really important to edit sparingly to reveal the real beauty in an image. And that's what will enhance a really great shot in the first place. So try not to let your photos be overdefined by the filters that you choose and the, um, the things that you apply to the image in your post-processing. Try to use them with a very light touch and just let the inner beauty of your pictures sing out. So let's talk Affinity Photo. Um, I use both the desktop and the iPad version and I use them fairly evenly actually. I couldn't say I necessarily use more um, of one type than the other. I do work a lot on trains while I'm traveling for work. Um, and so I think thanks to the nature of my work, the iPad is a really useful tool for me to have so that I can edit as I go. Um, but whenever I'm back in my studio, Affinity Photo for desktop is there when I sit at my desk and it's great because it works so, so it integrates so seamlessly with the iPad and the, the partnership between the two is fantastic. So um, before we go any further with Affinity, I'm going to treat you all like you've not used the, the app at all before or the software at all before. And let's have a quick look through the user interface and see if we can um, get our heads around what everything does, because this can sometimes in these big software um, applications feel a little bit confusing at first glance, but actually the way Affinity is laid out. Um, is really, really simple. So the user interface is basically how we interact with the software. And these are the key, the key things that you need to know about the UI, which is how we um, shorten user interface. So to start with, you have a document view. This is the whole area that displays the current document you have open and all the tools and menus that you have available to you. You can see at the moment that there's a highlighted area on screen um, with a pink highlight over it. 
Um, I'll be when I'm talking about areas that you uh, might be hard to understand where they are, you'll see a little pink rectangle over the screen so you know which part of the screen I'm talking about. So at the moment, the highlighted area is called the persona toolbar. This is the area that allows you to switch between personas and the personas are basically just the different workspaces for different tasks. So it's broken down into the different areas that you need to use. You'll see that the active personas icon always appears with a saturated color. So here the photo persona is selected and it shows as much brighter pink than the other personas. Again, you can see here the photo persona highlighted in the top there, it's a little icon. So most of your image editing jobs will be done and performed within the main photo persona. And this is where you'll find all your major functionality, you'll find your tools, your adjustments, your live filters, layer control, there's brushes, color swatches, any, all the main stuff that you'd use in your usual developing is there. So we don't need to look at all the different personas today that would take uh, eight hours or more to really break it down. We're just gonna look at the most relevant ones that um, are the ones that you'll be most likely to use when you're editing your photos. So um, the other thing I should mention very quickly as you can see highlighted in pink now is the develop persona. And this will open by default when you load a raw file. Now we're not gonna spend ages on raw files today that's another story for another day but um you'll find that when you open the developer persona, you've got a really intuitive slider based approach for making initial adjustments but what's interesting about the develop persona is you can actually use it without using a raw file so if you create a jpeg or a pixel sorry a pixel layer within your image that's got all the pixels on it so basically copy your photograph make a duplicate of that layer you can then open the develop layer and work on your duplicate layer um, if you try and open the develop layer and it doesn't work for you, it may well be that you haven't got a duplicate layer to work on and it doesn't like working on the background. So you'll find that it becomes available to you as soon as you create a duplicate layer. And the quickest way to create a duplicate layer in this app is to press either Control J or Command J, depending on your software, and that will give you one of many different ways to create a duplicate of the highlighted layer. We'll come more to looking at that in a minute, but just to be clear, um, Next up, we've got the menu bar across the top. Now the menu bar shows appropriate commands for the selected persona. So at the moment with photo persona selected, you can see we've got file, edit, text, document, layer, select, and so on across the top. And they are all organized by task and category. So that is your menu bar. Next up is the toolbar. Um, this, is, this contains commonly used functions and its contents change depending on the active persona. And these are all customizable. So you can bring the ones that you use most often to the, to the left side of this bar and kind of have the right ones hidden behind an arrow if you don't use them very often. So that's the toolbar. There's also a tools panel. Now the tools panel is on the left-hand side and this gives you access to various tools for editing. So the tools change based again on the persona that's selected. So you'll have the ones that are appropriate to whatever you're doing. And here we're looking at the photo, the photo persona again. So you can see here, if I go onto the next page, you can see some of the tools that are available. All the familiar essential tools will be shown. Most of these have keyboard shortcuts, which are easily found. Um, and you can also look um, at the way the tools are grouped so that they're kind of close to each other, ones that do similar tasks. The other thing to know about the tools is sometimes you'll see that they've got these little gray arrows in the bottom or little gray triangles next to some of the tools on the bottom right of the tool. That basically tells you that there's a tools panel available to you. And when you open the tools panel, but you just hover over that little gray arrow and a fly out menu will appear. And that fly out menu will basically give you a whole node of other tools. So at the moment you can see um, highlighted on my tool bar, or on my tools list down there, you can see the, um, the in painting brush is selected, but with the little fly out arrow, you can see I've also got the option of using a healing brush, a patch tool, a red eye removal tool and a blemish removal tool. So there are lots of other tools available if you remember to use your fly outs. So um, the context toolbar is next. And this presents options for the currently selected tool. So if at the moment, you, if you were to have the brush tool selected, you'd have the option to look at things like the, um, the width of your brush and the opacity of your brush. And here you can see I've got information about my image, like the size of it, um, what the display settings are and what units I'm looking at it in. So those are the, the sort of content, context specific um, options. 
So right next is the um, right studio here. You can see that this is where you set up all your panels and they provide various functionality to aid with editing. There are basic functionalities that you might have that work best for you. For me, I like to have it as you can see now, which is having the navigator on the and color and adjustments the top. Um, then I have in the middle row, I've got layers, and then on the bottom, I've got the history so I can have a look at what work I've done. So this kind of works best for me, but you'll all find your own setup, which works best for you at this stage. And I kind of like mine to stay quite lean and efficient to start with and not have loads of them open at any given time. So you can change what's visible by going here to the view menu across the top. And when you drop view down, you'll see um, additional panels are available within the studio option. So once studio is highlighted, you can turn on or off all of the different settings that you want to use. So I, I've obviously got adjustment, color, history, layers and navigator ticked. And you can see at the bottom, I've got a little tick to say that I want my studio on the right hand side. So that's how you set yourself up to do what you want it to do. OK, so next up. Um, one last thing I want to mention is layers. So um, the layers menu, as you can see, I've got open here on this image. You can see I've got a load of background layers selected there, but layers are a really useful feature of um, this um, software and something that I find just one of the most amazing things about being able to work like this, because this gives you the opportunity to work non-destructively. Okay. So working non-destructively means that you basically make changes without being frightened of those changes having an, a long lasting effect on your image. And that's really important to kind of give you the confidence to make work without, um, without that kind of concern that you're doing any damage to your base image. So you can use your layers, um, you can transform, scale, rotate and all of this stuff and it's all done non-destructively. You are not actually ever cropping any of your image area away. It's still available for you to come back and resize at any point during your exercise um, and so on. So they just retain their original resolution and quality as well. So you can still come back and manipulate them at a layer date later date not a layer date <laughs> um so live filter layers is the next thing you you also have live filter layers which are an amazing feature of affinity photo we'll look at these a bit more later on but you can make effects like blurring lighting and all sorts of other things like even perspective corrections and they can all be applied as non-destructive live filter layers as well and i like this because it means you can erase away from them you can mask them you can change the order of them and it's just it makes it a really nice free-flowing way to work. So let's look at editing workflow. The important thing to know about the editing workflow is that everyone has their own version of it and don't let anyone ever tell you that their way is the only way, but there is a kind of a general way that you can do things that will make your working life easier. And I found over my nearly 30 years of working professionally as a photographer that this is kind of the way that works best for me so um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on some of my ways of doing things I always start off by adjusting my composition first so I'll improve the composition with a series of tools such as crop rotate and perspective and so on um, the first thing I always do is attach um, is make my horizon straight if it's not already so if it's not I'll start with a rotate tool and once the rotate tool is open it's actually within crop. So you open the crop tool first, and then within the crop tool, you can choose the straighten um, option here. And you can see by straightening, when you choose the straighten tool, you'll have a little um, um, line that you can basically draw across. So you just trace a little way across your horizon line. It doesn't need, you don't need to draw a straight line where it should be. You draw a line along where it is. So as it's nice and wonky and your little spirit level that appears to help you draw the line, you just trace that along that wonky line. And when you release the line, the horizon will automatically straighten out for you. So you can then, if you're not happy with what it's done, you can grab anywhere outside of the frame uh, on, on the black map that's behind your picture frame. You can basically drag up and down and it will move your, it'll rearrange the image, um, rotating it as you move your mouse or your pointer. Um, so, the crop tool is the next one to mention. 
And Affinity Photo lets you crop unconstrained or you can use original custom aspect ratio. So I quite like to use the original one personally um, a lot of the time so that my image stays the same shape as it was when it came out the camera um, rather than ending up with strange, weird shaped images. Um, so you, you can also specify common print sizes like six by four or something like that. You can um, select the cog that's highlighted here with an arrow to access all the presets. Um, which is quite useful to go through. So if you wanted to do a square one, for example, you could use a one-to-one -one custom ratio and so on. And then below that, you can see the photographic paper ratios as well. Um, I also um, would point out at this point, you can change the mode. So when I mentioned I use original ratio earlier, this is where you find that it's in the mode. So you can go unconstrained, which means you can move any of the corners any way you like, or you can do it in um, original ratio mode or a custom ratio. So the last thing is what to point out that with all of your tools, once you're happy, you will often have the option to apply, which is the blue thing in the top left corner. So make sure you tick that to, make, to accept that change. So the next thing I want to point out is global adjustments. Um, and what's important about these is understanding that there's a difference between global and selective adjustments, the two different kinds of adjustments you make on your work. Global just means that it affects the entire image. And these will often be things like exposure, color and contrast corrections. The adjustment panel is the first thing you need to know about. This will allow you to apply colour and tonal corrections to your image non-destructively without making permanent changes to the underlying pixels. So we looked at where you open the adjustments panels up earlier from up in the view menu, view studio. You can choose adjustment as one of those and that will drop an adjustment panel into your right hand studio. And here is a zoomed up view of my right hand studio, which has now got a layer studio, a history studio and an adjustment studio. And within the adjustment studio, you, have, you can see loads and loads of different options. So here's where you can do things like adjust white balance, brightness and contrast, color balance, curves, exposure, levels, selective coloring, shadows, highlights, vibrance, you name it. It's all tucked away within here. Um, so one of these I would generally start with is to adjust my exposure. I like to always underexpose my images when I'm shooting them just to make sure that I've got all the detail and no blown out areas. Exposure adjustment will be made to this adjust to this layer in an adjustment layer. So here you can see um, I, there's two ways you can do it. You can either open up the adjustment in the panel on the right, as I showed you before, but just because variety is the spice of life, I'm going to show you that you can also open adjustment layer by going to layer at the top of your screen, choosing new adjustment layer and then selecting exposure from the right hand side. Once that's done, I'll now have a new exposure layer. Um, in my studio window. So on the right hand side there, you can see my layers and the, there's a blue highlighted layer at the moment, which is an exposure adjustment. Um, on the, it, within that blue highlighted layer, you can see a little white square with a circle on it. That's showing me that this is a mask um, area, a mask layer. The little white area is basically a visual of the mask and the adjustment is actually applied as a mask. So, um, you, once you open one of these um, layers, these adjustment layers, you'll get a little window that opens up um, and that's a pop up menu that will give you specific options that relate specifically to that adjustment that you're making. So here you can see I've got a slider where I can adjust my exposure and down at the bottom I can adjust the opacity level and the blend mode as well. So that's quite useful and you can um, come out of this um, by shutting it using the little uh, red square, the little red circle, or you can just tap on another layer or someone else in the document somewhere else in the document and it will um, just shut that um, that little pop up menu down. So anytime you want to adjust this exposure again, you can basically tap back on that layer and it will reopen your, um, your pop-up box again. So you can kind of add four more layers on top and think, oh, I've overexposed or underexposed my image. And at that point, you can just tap again on that layer and it will basically um, give you the option to adjust your exposure again as many times as you like throughout the thing. So... Um, the next thing I want to mention is cleaning up your images. So another way that I perfect my compositions is to just remove the odd blemish from the image altogether. So whenever you want to make quick corrections or either spend time doing really detailed touch-ups, you'll find that there's a really amazing array of tools available to you. Um, and I kind of touched on them earlier. I mentioned them when I was looking down at the tools on the left-hand side. Um, my favourite is the in-painting brush 
which is a picture of a brush with a little circle around it. And the in-painting brush is just magical, I think. It does a really great job of removing distracting elements. So here you can see, I'm happy with the composition of the ponies where they are in the frame, but in order to keep that composition, I've ended up having to include some pony poo in the foreground, which is less pleasing in my photograph. So I'd like to get rid of that, but I don't wanna crop away any of my image area. So the best way to do that is to, is to clone it away or in this case, to use the in-painting tool to get rid of it. That'd be one of the two tools I'd usually use. Um, before I do any taking away of anything like this though, I don't do it directly on my background layer. I would create a fresh layer. So there's that Command J or Control J, depending on your computer that I mentioned to you earlier. That will create a clean layer for you. It'll be called background copy, but if you click on the word background copy in that layer where my blue arrow is pointing, you can change the name of the layer. So I change it to clean so that I know what I'm dealing with. And with that layer labeled up as clean, I then use my um, tool to start brushing over the offending areas. So here you can see the blue arrow on the left is pointing to the, um, the healing tool set and the imprinting brush is available to me. And in case it isn't, just remember that you can drop down the fly out menu and you'll see all your different tools in there and in painting tool brush is the fourth one down in that row. And now I want to point out that when I do a cleanup of an offending object, it's really important not to take in too many of the surrounding pixels as well. So zoom in as much as you can so that you can get a really close um, uh, selection of, with your um, mouse or your finger if you're on an iPad, but basically to just select the area that's offensive and try not to bring too much of the area around. And when you do that, zooming in makes it much easier to see what you're healing anyway. But if you start doing that, you'll find that you collect um, only very local pixels and it'll look much neater and cleaner when you do it on a smaller scale like that. So here's a quick before and after to compare the improvements that have been made. Um, this is a really quick and rough fix and more could definitely be done, but this is a good starting point for just fixing your, um, fixing your images and retaining the composition that you wanted from the beginning. So if you don't wanna make an entire image adjustment, it's time to discover the hidden power of selective photo editing. Um, selective editing tools let you edit different parts of your photo completely separately. And that's a really important thing for you to understand as well, is that the difference between global where you're making a change across the board and selective is where you start doing just little things. So we've just done a selective adjustment of sorts when we've selected something offensive and removed it. Um, now we're gonna look at the, um, the kind of superpower of this kind of editing where you can basically um, master a set of tools that will take your editing to a whole new level and that is masking. So masking can really um, um, kind of give you extreme control over the way you work with your edits. So you can mask out certain areas of an edit within the mask tool and you mainly would do this in layers or sometimes your, the, the layer that you're working on has already got a mask attached to it. So I'll explain the two differences quickly. If you're working with a layer like I just did, which I created myself, a, that clean layer, if you remember, um, it doesn't have a mask attached. So if I wanted to mask a layer like that, I'd have to create a mask down at the bottom and you can see my arrow pointing at the little mask creation icon down there. So you can add a, a mask to any layer by highlighting that layer first and then choosing the mask to attach a mask layer to it. Um, but the, just to point out, as I've already said twice now, there's no need to clip masks to adjustment layers or live filter layers because they inherently already are their own masks. So you just need to simply select that layer and you can begin masking it where it is. So let me show you how that works because that's a really clever trick. So you do your masking by simply using the paintbrush tool. You can see on the left of the screen here, I'm pointing at the paintbrush tool. And next to the words paintbrush tool, you can see a B in brackets, which means you can just tap the letter B on your screen and it will automatically select the paintbrush tool for you. How clever is that? So um, on the right hand side, you can see that my white balance adjustment layer is selected. And what I've done here is I've turned the white balance layer up and I've made my sunset look much pinker than it was originally. But in doing so, unfortunately, it's made the sea look a bit too pink too. So I kind of want it to stay pinky orange in the sky, but I don't want to have a pinky orange ocean. I don't like it. So I'm going to mask the ocean out of this edit on, on the white balance adjustment. So the way I've done that is to basically choose, if I just go back one, you can see at the moment that my mask is white, which means I can see everything, the mask, everything is visible. I can basically open up 
um, a, a studio called Color, um, which at the moment isn't open here, but I'll show you. I can basically select my brush color, which at the moment is white, the same color as the white balance adjustment. So if I choose a black brush and paint on white, the black will obscure any of the white areas that I want it to. And if my mask is all black, that means the whole mask is hidden. And if I paint white, I can reveal a bit of the mask. So in this picture here, you can see that I'm revealing, or in fact, I'm masking away the, the, uh, some of the ocean areas. So the mask is being removed as I paint over it with a, blue brush, with a black brush, and you can see the blue ocean reappearing so that the mask is only applied to the top of the layer. So we'll look at this a bit in more depth for a second now. We're talking about selective colouring, basically. That's what we've just done. So you can use masking to create targeted colouring areas within your picture and to enhance or reduce colour in certain areas too by perhaps um, increasing the vibrance or saturation. Um, so how you might use this, for example, um, in, in practical terms is you can use a mask to alter the sky colour here, for example. So say I wanted to leave the buildings in their original colours, but I just wanted the sky to not look so grey, because when I took the photo, the sky looked really blue, but for some reason, my camera's recorded it looking quite monochromatic and flat. Although you can see I'm still getting the yellow light of the sun on the tops of the buildings. So here I can create an adjustment layer, first of all, from what a white balance layer. And what I've done here is I've turned the white balance layer very heavily just to make the point. I wouldn't be this unsubtle in real life, but for the benefit of this talk, I've turned the white balance and the um, all the way up to blue and I've turned the tint all the way up to green to give me a kind of a turquoisey colored cyan colored sky. But obviously this has made my buildings look a bit of a funny color too. And I really don't want that result across the buildings. So first of all, I'm going to go away and um, deal with um, masking some of this area out. So the way to do that again is to tap on that layer, the white balance layer that I just showed you I had here on the top right hand of the screen. You can see my white balance layer is there. And by tapping on that and pressing B for brush again, I can basically brush that mask. So I brush across all of the buildings with a black brush and the black brush will basically remove all of the, um, the color of that white balance layer everywhere but the buildings. Now you can see along the edges of the buildings for the picky ones amongst you that I've done a bit of a rough job there and I've overshot in places. If you overshoot anyway, you can basically just switch back to a white tool and paint it back in again. So you just paint it in and out using the black and white brush. Um, I'll show you another way you can do this, which is with selective lighting. So say I wanted to make the um, some areas of this picture a bit brighter, but not all of it. Um, I'm going to show you how to do targeted lighting also using your masking tools. So this time I've added a layer at the top. You can see on the right above the background layer. This is a brightness and contrast adjustment this time. And I've turned my brightness and contrast up ever so slightly. The brightness has gone up to 49%. And I am now going to use um, a layer. Um, to, but this time the layer, the brightness layer is showing the whole thing. It's made everything brighter and I don't want it to do that. So with that layer highlighted, I can press command or control plus I. So you press command or control with one finger and press the letter I with another finger and that will convert the layer mask from a white layer to a black mask layer. So with the, with the black mask in place, it means you now can't see the effect of this white balance, oh, sorry, this brightness tool at all. So now I'm gonna paint it in. So because my mask is black, I'm gonna use a white brush and I'm gonna start painting it in. So I mentioned to you earlier that you can change the color of the brush. I knew I had it on a slide here somewhere. You can change the color of the brush back and forth from black to white by having the color studio open. So you can open that studio by going to your view menu across the very top of your screen and then dropping that view menu down and opening up your studio menu within that and within studio you can choose color and here you can have your color studio open and on the left hand side you can see you've got the black and white colors selected at the moment there's two little circles so I can basically make um, I can switch back and forth between those two when I'm painting so um, now I'm going to just point something out to you. You see my little white mask as it was before on the right hand side. You can now see that the mask is half white and half black. 
as you paint on your mask, you can actually see the change happening on that tiny little mask within the um, within that tiny little area. So you can see how you're affecting your mask in that layer. And as you look at that layer mask at any time in the future, you can see that you've got some masking on there. So as I say, I'm switching back and I can also press the X to switch back between black and white to correct any overpainting. And I'm basically um, working my way very gradually. Now, if you look at my mask now, you can see that as well as a black area and a white area, there's also a tiny little area of gray. I know that the screen's probably quite little for you to see, but there is a gray area too. That's because I've adjusted the opacity of my paintbrush as I've gone along, and that's allowed me to mask the layer in with a gradient. So I've been able to go from not just a hard white line to a hard black line with my mask, but by adjusting my um, opacity of my brush to say 25 or 50%, I can also paint um, in, in a kind of a graduated or graduated color to give me a color gradient from one to the other. So the before and after of just turning up the brightness has actually had an, a remarkable effect on even what appears to be the saturation because it's just lifted everything out of the shadows. And that's basically just done it on that sort of triangular area on the right hand side. So I've left my bottom right completely alone. Um, and it's and the top right is alone and the triangle comes out from the middle right and goes over to the left. You can kind of see the difference in the brightness. So um, the next thing to think about is um, how you might want to save and export your files. Now, there's a lot to think about in terms of saving and exporting. Um, it can be a little bit confusing for people because automatically um, you need to think about a few things when you save. There's differences between saving your files and exporting them. And actually what that comes down to is um, that exporting the file is kind of preparing it to go out and be something um, in the outside world. So you might want to prepare your files as JPEGs and you might want to prepare your files as TIFFs or PDFs and all sorts of different things. So if you are going to send your work out into the real world, you're going to need to export it to do that. And when you open up um, the option to save, the, the way you do that is to, well, you can do um, command or control S to save, or um, you can um, also drop down from the file menu at the top, across the top next to the word Affinity Photo, you've got a file menu. And when you drop that down, you'll see that the export option is there for you as well. So within the export option, there's um, you, you open up this kind of dialog window and you'll see here with the dialog window open that across the top, I've got a ribbon of all the different saving options I've got. So I've got um, PNG, JPEG, GIF, TIFF, PSD, PDF, and so on, various other ones as well. So you first of all want to select what your file output is going to be. And once you've done that, you can start looking at um, how you um, save it. So you can choose your different presets if you want to. So you've got different qualities of JPEG. You can also use the slider. You can see there's a blue slider there next to the word quality where you can drag it from left to right. Um, so saving the size of your JPEG, I tend to save all my JPEGs at a quality of 100, to be honest. And that's mainly because um, I don't often see the, the reason for having poorer quality images. Although if I'm gonna do them for output to screen, I'd save them not at 300, but at 72 DPI. But that's, um, that's more to do with, you know, knowing where your output's gonna be, whether it's for print or for screen. So you can also then um, see across the bottom, you'll see that it gives you an estimated file size. So when you're entering your work into competitions and people say, please make sure your image is no larger than five meg, this is where you can have a look and be clear if you've missed it along, there's information that will tell you this along the top sometimes on some of your contextual um, toolbars, but you can also see it here. So you've got an estimated file size at the moment that's showing us 12.88 meg with JPEG selected. As I'm sure most of you are aware, JPEG is a, a lossy compressed format and saving in JPEG will make your images smaller, but it doesn't always keep them in the best quality. So if you were to choose TIFF instead to save your files, you would have an uncompressed file format. You'd save all the quality of your image, 
but the downside of this would be that your file size will increase quite substantially when you do this. So there is going to be a payoff at this point between um, how you save your image. So have a think about that. What you can do is you could export it multiple times, though, because you're just doing an export here. So this is going to create a separate file to the one that you've been working on. And you can select, like I do, to export your file to a separate folder. So I have a work file folder. I have my original images. And then I have a working folder and I have an exports folder as well. So my exports are literally just where I save my exported files that are ready to go off to clients, wherever they are, magazines, newspapers, galleries or whatever. But um, the working file is the thing I'm going to explain next. So as well as exporting, you can also choose the save as option. Now, I haven't got a slide for this, but just to, to point out to you that when you save your files, what you're actually saving is the um, proprietary affinity photo work files. So all your layers and everything that you're working on are sa saved as an affinity photo document. Um, you can choose where you select them. Um, but what you have then is a document that you can open and close as many times as you like and revisit your edits as often as you like. And in doing that, you're basically able to come, kind of come back as many times as you want and resize it for different exports. So don't feel like you have to kind of get stuck on exporting it just the one time. You can revisit your work file. So I always save that as my affinity work file. And then, I, as I say, I keep my exports separately. So I've kind of whisked through that a bit faster than I intended to, but I think that there might be lots of questions about things like masking and so on. So at this point, I'm going to go over slightly earlier than anticipated and just say, if anyone's got any questions, questions about any of it, we can now rewind back to any of the points where you might have got confused and feel free to um, dig a bit deeper with your own questions into what you need to know. So everybody out there, any questions? We have some questions. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Angela. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, the first question is, how do you put a studio photo at the top? Her, person asking said hers is at the bottom of the screen. So at the moment, I've got the view across the top. So are you saying that yours appears at the bottom? Yes, it looks that way. Um, OK, so you can toggle your UI and change some of the views of where things are. And you can kind of customize all your toolbars and stuff. So if you go through the, um, the view menu where yours is on the bottom, um, you should be able to move these sort of things around so that you can place them in place in, in situations on your board that suits you better. But a lot of people prefer to have it on the bottom. So don't feel like it's all important to have it on the top. If you're used to having it there, it might not be a bad idea to leave it where it is while you get more familiar with the rest of the user interface. A few people have asked whether there's a book um, that you would recommend for uh, Affinity Photo? I actually, let me grab mine. My favourite of all is just here on my desk, actually. It's Affinity Photo's own workbook. Oh, I'm right. showing it on screen. That's the one I've always used. I've never bought any books by anyone else, but Affinity have their own photo workbook, which I think is the best one to, to get to get, honestly. It's not the cheapest book, but it's the absolute Bible for everything Affinity. So I learned my way through the app by basically just reading that book cover to cover. Okay. So that would be the one I recommend. Uh, now, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this because uh, someone's saying they have got Photoshop elements and they said, does Affinity Photo do all the things that complete Photoshop does? So, um, yes, it does, basically. Yeah. yeah um, in terms of when I switched over, funnily enough, I, when I switched over from Photoshop to Affinity, I was too scared to get rid of a, a Photoshop at first because I was convinced I'd need to go back. And I realized three months later that I'd been paying my monthly subscription to Adobe and I hadn't opened it once. So in my day to day workflow and I literally can spend four or five hours a day, some weeks um, on my computer, just editing photos for various clients and editing stuff for my galleries. And I had a range of different jobs that I have to do depending on the kind of work you know if I'm doing my my high art stuff I do a lot of color retouching and um, the kind of exporting and, and th that sort of side of things that I do is very different to the images that I process for landscape photography magazines for example but I hadn't opened it at all so I hadn't found any area that I was struggling with um, within, you know, I wasn't missing Photoshop at all, to be perfectly honest, or, or, nor Lightroom, actually. So I just stopped paying for them at that point, And I've not really missed them since. <laughs> Fair enough. 
Um, how do you select the area before you remove the offending part of the image? So I think this is talking about when you were using the... OK, um, so I'll do this now. Let's have a look. So um, to start with, just so that I can demonstrate, can you see my mouse now? Yes. Moving around the house. Yes. OK, so you can see, say, for, say, for example, I didn't love the... Um, let's find something that's nice and visible to remove. OK, let's try and move, remove this shadow here. Um, so the first thing, as I said to you earlier, that I would do, and I'll do it now, is to permit press Command-J or Control-J, and I've now created a second layer um, in my layers tool here. You can see I'm going to highlight that by tapping on it, and I'm going to change its name to Clean. Okay, so I've now got a duplicate layer, which is called Clean. And just to remind you that you can also go, whoops, I've moved that. You can go to Layers along the top, or for some of you along the bottom, and you can duplicate your layer there as well. It's just as easy to duplicate it there, but I prefer to use Command J because it's just quicker. So I've now got a clean pixel layer. I'm now going to come over here to the in painting brush, which is one, two, three, four, five, six from the bottom. If I can't see the in painting brush and I'm perhaps seeing the healing tool brush instead, just remember to drop that fly out menu by highlighting that corner and then you can choose your other tools. So I've now chosen my in painting tool brush and I'm going to zoom in. So this was photo was taken on a smartphone on a really old smartphone at that. So excuse the quality. So with this area highlighted with my in painting brush, I'm just now basically brushing over the area and that's showing me in red what's selected. And then when I zoom out, you see the healing brush has done its job and there it is. And now the other advantage of having two layers is I've got a before and after, um, an easy before and after. So I can turn off the visibility of the clean layer that I've just created and see if it's made a difference to the image. So if I just press command zero for a second so that you can see the whole image on screen, and I'm now going to tick, turn this little tick off here to make the, cl the clean layer invisible. And now I can see my base layer underneath and I can see the clean cleanup job that I've done. So I tend to do this a lot, is basically to turn my layers on and off, especially when I'm doing things like cleaning and just make sure that the cleaning isn't visible. And I do that by being able, by turning it on and off to see if it, if it jumps out at me that it's very visible when it comes back. So you're literally just to show you again, let's find another area to clean. OK, I'm changing my brush size by using the, um, you know, the little square parentheses that are on the right hand side of your keyboard, usually next to the letter P, the little square arrows. You can make your brush size bigger or smaller in this tool by just tapping on the left or right of that. So I'm tapping left on the left parentheses at the moment to make that um, tool smaller. And as I zoom in, you'll see the brush size comes with me. So I'm just gonna make that small enough so that I can just basically using my mouse or in my case, my Wacom pencil, I'm basically just covering over this area. And as soon as I release it, it's done the job for me already. So command zero to have a look at the whole screen. Let's just look at the, let's just zoom in slightly on the grass and I can turn it on and off now and you can see the places where I've removed the grass and I think possibly it's better for it. I wasn't intending to remove it here, but you can see that that's how it's done. So um, you can see if you do too small a selection just quickly, you end up doing a kind of a rough scratchy colouring in. It'll still do an OK job, but I prefer to just kind of make the brush roughly the size. And when you do it like that, can you see how the edges of the brush look kind of graduated out? They've got smooth, soft edges. You can change the hardness of your brush here. So I like to work with a really low hardness. So quite a soft edge brush. I've got it set to eight. And in this case, this means that my edges are not quite so visible. And here you can see a classic example of it not having done a very good job of the cleanup. So in this case, I can press Command Z which is another tool I wanted to tell you about, and that is undo. And for those of you on PCs, you can press Control Z to undo it, but Command Z removes that offending area, and then I can ask it to do it again. So this time I'm gonna just choose a slightly smaller area, and that's done a better job of adjusting it. So I'm just gonna go through and do little adjustments this time to make that look a bit more natural. Hang on, let's have a look now and do my on and off again. And you can see the little areas kind of coming and going. So that's how I work with that brush, basically. Use it like a paintbrush almost and just kind of brush in the little areas. Does that answer that question? Yes. 
I think it does. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so someone was asking, as I think you've probably just answered it, how do you have a different shaped in painting area that isn't round? I think the answer is to have a small brush and paint. Or paint. Yeah, <laughs> so just change yeah. the size of it. And you're basically using it like a pencil or a, a writing line and changing it in. You can change um, some of your brush um, attributes. But to be honest, I think that's a, a kind of unnecessary fiddle to do that unless you're doing, even if you were kind of getting rid of really sharp lines, I still tend to work with a brush. So let's try and find something, there's like a line there, even though that's a fairly straight up hard line, I would still just take it out with the brush. And that reason why I kind of like to use a round edged, but just smaller brush like that is because it looks more organic and less obvious to the eye when you come back later. So it just kind of keeps it looking more natural. You can see here, by the way, where I removed that bit of glow, it hasn't done a great job. Uh, it's removed the glow, but the, there was a background glow to that, which looks a bit unnatural. That was nothing to do with the um, software. That was to do with what was remaining in that image. So in this case, I'm going to just try and make a brush selection that covers all of it and see if that makes it look more natural. And it doesn't. So let me just show you something quickly. In this case, I would be more likely to go and use the clone tool, which isn't part of this menu selection here the clone tool exists separately and the clone brush does a really nice job of just lifting textural areas like this and making a copy so i'm going to go and look for somewhere that looks similar to clone and here i'm going to have to use the option tool first so i'll press the option tool to tell it what it is i want to select so with my mouse hovering over somewhere i'll press option and it now knows that this is what i want to sample and then I'll go and use the clone tool to just brush over that area instead. And now when I do it, that's much less visible. That's done a much better job because that's given me grass texture where there wasn't before. So you can see that's done a really nice job now of cleaning that away. There you go. Okay. Um, you may have sort of through using layers sort of demonstrated it, but uh, someone said they can't see that the layers that you were talking about. And I wonder if perhaps you could just explain to someone kind of what layers are and, you know, very briefly okay. how they work. So there's different ways of working with layers. You can see that I've just created a layer here to work on from a basic layer um, because I needed to make a clean layer in this image. So now let's say I wanted to go and do something else to this picture. And let's say the next thing I wanted to do was make the sky look even more dramatic, okay? So there's lots of different ways I can work with layers, but in this instance, um, I, I just need to move the zoom controls out of the way for a second, because they're in the middle of my screen and they're making it difficult for me to see the, um, there we go, I've moved into my other screen. So now I can see my top menu. I could go to my filters, for example, and open up a sharpening filter. So if I go to sharpen, unsharp mask and choose clarity, which is one of the ways that you can increase the sharpness of your image, um, by doing a clarity layer, that's automatically applied it to the layer that I had before. So I just wanna point something out to you, which is that when you're working with filters, it's really important to do the same thing again and create a layer for it to work on. So you can see now that I've applied this clarity strength layer, but I've accidentally applied it to my clean layer. And that's not ideal because if I now wanna come back and fix the clean layer later, I've now got some other layer attached to it as well. So the idea here is that you wanna make each layer each adjustment that you make have its own separate layer to work on. So for me to do a filter layer here, I could do it two ways. I can go with the, um, I can create a filter from scratch, but I could also go to the layer tool and create a new live filter layer. And with the live filter layers, it will automatically create a layer for me. So by going to live filter layer, sharpen again, it's just another way of doing the same job really, but this time it automatically creates a layer for you and choosing clarity you can see that it's actually created a clarity mask over that layer. So now I can make an adjustment to the clarity, but it's not actually adjusting, it's not actually affecting, sorry, the, um, the layer itself, but it's a mask on top of that layer. So that's another way of adding layers, but I'm just gonna delete that quickly. So I would tend to do this by creating, come on, Jay, another new layer, and I'm gonna call it clarity. And then I can choose whether I apply it as a mask or a filter. So let's just do it as a, um, 
adjustable live filter because this means I can keep making adjustments to it as many times as I like. Put my picture back here and I can turn up the strength of my clarity layer. So I've made it look really stormy in that sky now. I would never recommend using 100% for your strength, but if I say turn it up to about, 30 always feels like a good number for me. If I put something up to about 30 um, on my clarity layer, I can shut that so that all belongs like that. But now, okay, so I've got this area here and I quite like that I've given it some clarity. So I just wanna quickly show you something with masking while I've got the chance to demonstrate this. You can see at the moment that my clarity mask is showing that it's white, which means the clarity is affecting the entire image. But if I wanted the clarity to just make the sky look sharper, but not necessarily the foreground, I could mask it. But because that's going to be really hard for you to see on this layer, I'm going to show you how to create another layer and I'll show you how to mask that layer. So this layer I, I'm going to create by opening up my layers and I'm going to choose a new adjustment layer. OK, so the adjustment layer I'm going to do is one that we looked at earlier. Funny enough, we'll do it like this because it's nice and visible. I'll choose white balance. OK, and I get a little pop up menu, which because I'm screen sharing, you guys might not be able to see my pop up menu, but a pop up menu is giving me the option to change the sliders on my screen. So let's say I want to make the sky look a bit bluer and a bit greener. Actually, no, instead of making the sky look a different color, let's do this a different way and let's make the sky, the grass look greener because it looks a bit yellow in this shot, doesn't it? So let's give the grass a bit of greenness, so a more natural green, perhaps. Um, and you can now see that I've got a green grass, but unfortunately I've now also got a bit of a green sky that I don't want. So this layer that's been created here is called a white balance adjustment layer. And you can see it at the moment, it's got a white mask, which is saying that everything is visible. So what I'm gonna do is have a look quickly what color my paintbrush is, and I've currently got black selected. So if I press B for brush, you can now see that my brush tool has been selected on the right hand side. I'm now going to use those square parentheses again to change the size of my brush. And if you watch now, as I brush on over this area, you can see, oops, if I open up layers, you'll be able to see it on there too. Can you see the brush marks appearing in black here? You can see where I'm brushing on my mask. It's turning that, that area black. It's showing you where I'm brushing black on this mask. But also on my picture, you can see that I've, I've, I've covered up the greenness that I've added to that layer so that the greenness now only applies to the grass and it's not in the sky area. So now I've got my nice normal sky color again, but I've got a green grass. And just to show you the before and after on that, that's it before looking a bit yellow and now I've changed it to a greener color. So that's the kind of way that you can work with layers basically by adding layers through adjustment layers or creating layers yourself and then applying different filters to them and then masking them. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, a few people have asked about uh, digital as asset management. So perhaps they're using um, Lightroom, so they're using the catalog tool or they've got Bridge, Adobe Bridge, or they've got mm -hmm. um, the organizer of elements. Yeah. What, what do you use for? I use Adobe Bridge? Bridge, but funnily enough, it's free. So you can have right. Adobe, Adobe Bridge for free and you don't have to pay for any of the other Adobe software. So I just have that one for free and I still use Bridge the same as I always did. I still use it for sorting through my images, selecting, doing sideshows selecting and all the rest of it um, and it's all there available to me but there are some there are other options that you can use um, within these tools as well so I'm just trying to remember I'm having a bit of a senior moment I just need to remember where they are there are options within here as well where you can do some of the um, jobs that you would also do on bridge so you can make changes like um, you can do some batch um, um, functions as well but for the life of me I can't remember where they are for a second but um, yes basically on the whole I tend to do as much as I can directly through bridge and that sort of works for me I mean it's different for everybody if you've got one that you work I think with elements you don't pay for that do you is that you buy it once and then that's it or has that become part of the subscription model as well now no that is that is a one-off payment as well OK, so once you've got elements and you if you're already using elements to do your organizer, then just keep doing that. But just, make, you know, come and use Affinity to do that part of it. So um, I have a thing set on my computer so that when I double click in bridge, I've have you can open up your bridge settings, by the way, and you can tell bridge to um, if I just open bridge quickly when you open up your bridge. Um, 
when you open up Bridge and go to your settings within Bridge and your preferences, you can actually tell Bridge with the, um, how you want it to open files. So you've got um, within your preferences, you've got file type, um, sorry, not file type associations. I think it's either interface or something like that or general opening, but one of them will allow you to, it'll tell you what program to open when you double click on an image in Bridge and you can actually choose um, Affinity from that drop down menu and it will automatically open the image in Affinity. So I find that works really seamlessly for me. And of course you set it up once and then you don't need to do it again. Which exactly. Is it just, <laughs> yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's long gone, but yeah. <laughs> yeah you can find it in Google, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, is the develop develop persona like Adobe Camera Raw? It is, and it's kind of like um, Lightroom as well. It's you. If you've used Lightroom, you'll find it's very familiar. It does all of those. You know, it's all those sort of things. It's slider based control. If I just create a stamp layer here quickly. Oh, it's trying to do it in Zoom, and I don't want to do that. If I create a quick stamp layer on here, so I've created a pixel layer of everything that's happened so far. Um, Actually, what I'm going to do very quickly is just get rid of some of these things so that I can show you these. Um, I'm just going to drag those layers to the dustbin and get rid of them. There you go, bin those. And if I now create a, a brand new layer so that I don't affect my clean layer, and I'm going to call this clean layer, this new layer, develop. And I'm now going to go to the top of my menu and I'm going to open up the develop persona, which is this one here that I've just clicked on. So I've now got the opportunity to show you some of the, um, the tools within this. So you've got your basic tools where you can change slide, make slider based changes to exposure and brightness and contrast and clarity and so on. You can change your saturation. Um, there's lots of different things you can do. You can, um, one of the things that's amazing about this tool, and I actually need to just come out of this for a second because I've made that look horrendous. Um, with the develop tool, I should mention, especially because I've got a fairly noisy image here anyway, let me open up this noisy area on screen so you can have a look at it. Affinity has got some like um, best in class um, noise reduction. And this is one of the things I absolutely love best about Affinity actually, compared to Photoshop, Affinity's noise reduction is amazing. So you can do, um, I just wanna go over here on this panel here, you can behind the basics panel is a details panel and you can turn on the noise reduction. You basically just tap on the word to open them up. Um, I need to just get rid of this history thing out of the way here. Let me just get rid of that. Um, you can basically change your luminance and your color contribution to your noise. So basically you can drag, you can see that it's making everything look a bit blurry, but you can actually affect, um, you can make quite successful noise reduction in certain areas. And I just wanna remind you that like everything else, you can mask it. So say I wanted to just reduce the noise and nothing else. I could come along here and change my luminance um, and make, get rid of some of the noise in my picture and then choose to develop this image. And I've now got a layer that's got noise reduction in it, just noise reduction and nothing else. So if I turn that layer off, the noise comes back. And then I could obviously create a mask by opening up a mask down there. And then I could then paint that out so that the, the noise is only in the areas where I need it to be removed and it doesn't affect the whole image and make some areas softer than others. I hope that makes sense. I know masking is a bit of a thing to get your head around. The best thing I can re recommend, because it's not easy something to do in these kind of formats in the short space of time, is to go and watch um, lots of the Affinity videos. James Ritson, who's the main man at Affinity, does brilliant Affinity videos on the um, Affinity YouTube channel. There's also Affinity Revolution, Ezra is the guy, the American guy who has that one. He's really, really good as well. And there's a guy called Oliver Saracas, or Saracas, I don't know how to pronounce, pronounce his surname, who also has an amazing YouTube channel full of affinity, um, affinity videos. So I did a lot of my early learning by just going and watching James Ritson doing his thing. Um, and, you know, from there, I've kind of developed um, my skill set as I've gone along, but just, you know, the, the internet is full of fantastic tutorials for these things when you want to know a specific skill. So just Google it and you'll find it straight away. Okay. Um, we've got quite a few questions to get That's through. Okay. So, um, someone I'll be quick. Missed, sorry, someone missed how to zoom in and out. Could you just show them again, please? So there's lots of different ways to zoom in and out. You can either pinch on your mouse pad, which is what I do. So I'm using a two, pick, two finger pinch out and pinch in on my touchpad on my um, MacBook Pro. You can also do it by having a window open here. So at the moment, 
if I, I just, for some reason, Zoom keeps putting my Zoom controls over this side. I'm just going to move them out the way again. On the top of the screen here, if you go to view and then you go to studio, you can actually open a navigator panel. So with the navigator panel open, um, it, it's currently popped out, so I'm just going to dock it on the bottom. You can see my area at the bottom on right hand side of my screen has gone blue because I'm docking a navigator panel down there. And with the navigator panel in place, you can either use the slider to zoom in and out. You can use the minus or the plus there to zoom in and out. If you like using numbers, you can type numbers into that thing to zoom in and out. Um, and you can then basically navigate around the image by dragging your mouse around the um, the little picture in the navigator. So that kind of helps you locate yourself. Can you see on my little navigator, a little blue um, rectangle has popped up? Yes. So that navigator allows me to move within the navigator window and basically see which part of the picture I'm looking at. There you go. What's the next question? Someone asked earlier what the price was and I said it's 47.99, um, mm -hmm. but they've come back and asked, does that price include any upgrades? Do you know if it does? Yes, all upgrades are included forever. Right, so it's a one-off payment and that's that. One-off payment and you don't have to pay for it again. And a top tip if you, you know, is if you do things like you're going to the um, photography show and stuff like that, is they always do deals at times like that. And you might find that they do a kind of like a full deal or whatever. So sometimes if you keep your eyes peeled, you can pick it up for like £29 or whatever. Um, but yes, once you've paid for it once, it's yours forever and you don't have to pay for any upgrades. It's fantastic. Great stuff. Um, you mentioned filters. Can you use plugins like uh, Silver Effects? So that's Nick Collection and things. Yeah, so you can do very, there's plugins and LUTs and all sorts of things that you can add to it. Um, you can basically adjust, you can add various. Um, so I don't know if any of you know what LUTs are, they're lookup tables, which are kind of like a type of filter where people can, you can make your own or people can do them for you and you can buy various ones a lot of them these days if you they'll they'll list you used to see that they just said available just for photoshop but if you go to sort of creative market or something and you want to buy a set of filters or color overlays or something you just have to look and see if they say that they work on um as LUTs too but um i i've, I've got loads of them that i use so yes you can okay and is there a way to apply edits from one photo to another yeah you can um you can copy your edits and apply them to multiple things. One of the ways you can do that is to save them um, as a, an adjustment. I'm just trying to think about the quickest way to do that. So you can create things like um, you can create your own LUTs and you can record your um, your edits and then kind of make a batch job of it. So I remember I said to you earlier that some of the tools that you can do, I couldn't remember where it was. I've just remembered where it was. It's under file. I was looking at file earlier, but I was blinded. You can see under file there, it says new batch job. Um, so some of those, those um, that functionality that we were talking about that's, um, that comes over from um, places like Lightroom and stuff like that, you can do within that new batch job. Um, and when you open that you, that window, it gives you that option to um, save as an AF photo, as a JPEG and so on. So that is one of the batches that you can do, but you can also record what's known as a macro. So you can create macros, so you can start the recording and do a load of edits and then stop the recording and give that macro a name. For example, resize, resample an image to 72 DPI and save it at 1,500 pixels, and then you can save that as a macro. And um, can you guys see my new batch job pop-out screen that's come up, or is that? Yes. You can. So you can see here that I've got some macros saved. I could do that with edits as well. So you can save as many macros as you like, and then you just select that one and apply it, and it will run it to all the images that you've selected in your set. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Oh, someone would like to know if you don't want to keep an if they don't want to keep an adjustment, how do they return to the previous stage? Oh, okay. So there's lots of different ways you can do it. I'll just show you. So before I was showing you that you could open up adjustment layers from the top here. I just want to remind you that you can also create an adjustment studio on the right hand side. So we'll do that now just to put it in your mind. So we'll go to studio and we'll add adjustment. There it is at the top. So I've now got an adjustment layer and I'm going to move it and bank it up here rather than have it at the bottom or actually where should I, I might put it here instead I'll put it above there so I've now got an adjustment layer and let's say I put in a um, black and white adjustment I'll go to this and I put it in and it's cold 
There you go. So I've got this adjustment. And then after a while, I decided I don't want it anymore. There's lots of different things you can do. You can press Command Z and that will just remove that layer. The last thing, what, what Command Z is, it doesn't remove the layer, but it just gets rid of the last thing you did. OK, um, another way of doing it. Let me just um, add that layer again. So uh, redo, add black and white. Um, just to show you other ways you can get rid of it. You can just hide it by turning its visibility off on the right hand side. Um, you can also take your layer like that. So tap on it and highlight it and then drag it to the dustbin and just dump the layer. So that's three different ways of getting rid of it. Great. Thank you. There's a few people asking about cropping and how do you crop to a specific size, either um, I'll show you know, pixel you. dimensions? OK, so you can go to your crop tool on the left hand side. You can you can change your pixel dimensions by just typing them in up here. You can also choose a custom ratio, for example, um, the, the one I was. So you can see here the custom ratio is three by four at the moment, but you can adjust your custom ratio yourself. So you could set up your own custom ratio here. Um, you can show you can do unconstrained, obviously, and just change it anyhow, any which way you like. I'm just going to go back to that. But if you want to do um, one of the presets, you need to drop down this little cog wheel here. And with that cog wheel open, I'm just going to make this drag this window out, drag this uh, slider down a little bit. You can see here that I've got loads of different options available. So you've got paper sizes, screen sizes. Um, Photographic paper is one you, you as photographers might be form, form, more familiar with, like 10 by 8 or so on. And then also you've got your common ratios. So, you know, you can see things like wide angles, 16 into 9 and 3 by 4 and 5 by 4 that some photographers like to use. So your custom ratios are all tucked away in there as well. Someone says that she struggles with masking. Often she thinks she's got the layers right, but when she tries to paint the mask on, nothing happens. I was wondering if perhaps the wrong colour is selected. Yeah, so just remember to double check that your paintbrush is the opposite colour to the mask. So I always, always, always have my colour studio open, or well, not open, but in my, you know, one of the ones that's available to me. And then it's really easy. When I mask, the first thing I do is look at the mask layer that I want to work, the layer mask that I want to work on. So I'll just quickly um, add a, an adjustment layer there so that you can see that I've got a layer mask. And my layer mask is white. So in the, immediately when I want to make work, I can see that I'm working with a white mask. So if I go to color and make sure that the, br the black brush is selected, then when I brush, I'm basically yeah. definitely masking. But the other thing is to make sure that you're masking in the um, masking in the right place. Obviously, I didn't make an adjustment to the exposure. But here you can see now the masking is happening. So um, the way to test whether you've got your masking right or not is to do this, is to create something really hideously ugly and make it really extreme. And then you, when you brush your brush back and forth, you'll be able to clearly see the change. A lot of times when people think they can't see their mask making a difference, it's basically nothing more than the fact that they've been so subtle with their adjustment that they're not noticing the change happening. Okay. Okay. We have a few questions relating to why you create multiple layers of the same photo and why you group them. The reason why I always create multiple layers is because then I know what every single adjustment is. So I'm creating some, in this case, when you say creating multiple layers of the same image, I wonder if you just mean like re recreating the photo multiple times rather than just painting onto a layer. When you're doing things like cleaning up, you can't paint onto an empty layer. It needs to be painted onto a layer that's got pixels in it. So you have to duplicate the image layer to do that. Obviously, with the adjustment layers, you've seen that they create their own masks and you don't need to do it and they create their own layers to do that. So it's basically a way the whole idea behind having layers is you have lots of layers and in having those, you can clearly see all the stages of your adjustments and you can drag them around and reorder them and make specific changes to the areas. And the most important thing to know about layers is that thing I said earlier about turning your ticks on and off. If you've got a problem somewhere in, a, in, a, in an edit that's got 19 layers in it, by turning each layer on and off individually, you'll be able to identify which layer it is that's creating the problem say banding or artifacting or whatever it is a weird color cast and then you can go to that layer once you've identified which one it is and make a fix okay and someone's asking is um, doesn't copying the layer multiple times end up uh, make you have a huge image it or certainly does size. it will bloat your image size but there is that is the rub in being an artist and making beautiful edits that's part of what being a professional or not even a professional, but a proper editing, 
you know, practice is all about is as, as understanding that you don't want to degrade your image. And if you keep making all of your edits onto that one layer, you aren't going to, you're going to have to undo all the edits you did to get to the one where you've got a problem and then redo them all again. So in terms of your time, you could lose days doing that, where really, if you just want to go to the one layer that you need to fix, that's why you do it like that. Okay. And someone was asking about uh, the iPad version. Um, they wanted to know the price. I just looked it up. It's nineteen forty nine. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> it fluctuates from time to time. So thank you, Angela. Yeah, yes. I always tell people it's about the £20 mark. So that's pretty spot on. I highly recommend the iPad one. Um, if you've got an iPad and an Apple Pencil, because you can start the edit mobile on your sofa while you're watching telly. And then next time you're at your desk, you'll seamlessly switch it over to carry on and the other thing. And they, like I said earlier, they work together really nicely as a pair. Okay. Now, if anyone has sort of still got some questions, would you other perhaps if they google or go to the affinity photo youtube channel that would be a good way to yeah there are, everything is answered on there so you uh, google your specific question and i'm i i, I thought i'd stop early because i knew there'd be loads of questions but i still obviously didn't stop early enough i tried to get through <laughs> because i could but there you go <laughs> No, that's fine. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, it's been uh, lovely chatting with you, Joe, and great to see um, how you use Affinity Photo. Thank you very much. It's an absolute the webinar pleasure. Tonight. Thank you for having me.